We're talking with Don Lutz from Lance Cruz High School in the Lance Cruz School District, a longtime teacher and by every estimation, the father of lacrosse in Michigan. First of all, thank you for sitting down and, and taking time with us. And uh, you are the reason we're all here uh, from a Hall of Fame perspective. And um, you went to Ohio University. And I just, first of all, thank you for sitting down and talking with us. It's kind of cool and be able to talk a little bit about the history. So I guess my first question is, where did it all start for you? Well, I, uh, I grew up in northeastern Ohio, uh, town, industrial town, Barberton, Ohio, same town as, uh, as Bo Schembechler. Football was the most important thing in the world to a high school kid uh, in that town. And uh, there were six to 8,000 fans at the games on Friday nights. And, uh, with the stadium that held 20,000? No, that's about what it held. But uh, when we played Maslin, Ohio, we... Okay, Maslin's got the big stadium. They got, yeah, it was 18,000. Right. Uh, so, I, you know, we played in front of 18,000 people when we played them. But um, now it's 19,500. They expanded. But uh, at any rate, uh, football was important. Uh, but I kind of, like, got burned out, and I told the coach I wasn't interested anymore in football. And... and uh, didn't talk to the visiting coach from University of Toledo who was interested. And, uh, and I went to Ohio U uh, just as a student, but I missed it. So I went out my, I talked to the head football coach at Ohio U, a man named Bill Hess at the time. And uh, I asked him if I could come out and, and he said, well, you're too small, which I was, I was 5'9", 185 pounds, played on a line and played center and nose guard in high school. So anyway, uh, uh, I talked him into letting me lift weights. I got up to 195, went out for spring ball, and uh, that would have been the spring of uh, 63, I guess. I guess that would be 63, my sophomore year. And, uh, and I immediately tore my ACL and fractured the shoulder, and uh, they taped me up for the scrimmage on Saturday. I, played with one half of a body, and uh, when it was over, I took all my equipment, put it on the counter, and said goodbye, said goodbye to football. So then we fast forward a couple of years uh, to, uh, I had a minor in physical education, and I majored in science comprehensive, emphasis on chemistry. I spent my life here so teaching So you, you always knew you wanted to be a teacher? Yes, I, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, I went to school the first year and a half, I was in engineering. And then I went home for the summer and I helped the football coach out. And I really enjoyed working with, uh, he gave me this one kid that was struggling. And, uh, you know, and I worked with him, uh, you know, with line play and I just really enjoyed it. And, I, and uh, when I, yeah, when I, when I went back to school, I had a disastrous uh, first semester, sophomore year. The, my first serious love affair, she dropped out of school. My best friend from, from uh, childhood got killed in an automobile accident, and I had seen him like 10 minutes before he died. Wow. He invited me to go with him, and I didn't. Otherwise, we might not be speaking. Divine here. intervention. Uh, serendipity. Something. Everything in life I've learned is serendipitous. It's uh, all a matter of chance. Things that we do, things that decisions we make, things that happen to us. So, uh, so I had I had a disaster, and I I wound up uh, grade wise. So I wound up changing majors and went into education my second semester, sophomore year. Well, anyway, uh, going to 1965, maybe, uh, uh, Tiff Cook, who became a professor of physical education at Ohio U, was a uh, Canadian fellow who uh, was the goalie on the hockey team. Right. At Ohio U, and he came up to me one day in class, and he and he said, "Hey, I'm going to start a lacrosse team here at Ohio U. I said, Are you interested?" 
so you might might be interested. Uh, would you like to try it? So, of course, like what happens to a lot of people, he took me outside with a stick and playing catch, and you know, and I got hooked. And uh, and, and he talked uh, John McComb, who was the soccer and hockey coach at legendary uh, soccer and hockey coach at Ohio U at the time. Uh, he talked him into. Uh, running a skills class in the spring of 65, which I signed up for and took, and uh, just really got hooked on the game. I remember going home for the summer. I was up at the park, and I was throwing the ball up in the air and running and catching it and stuff, and some woman was walking her dog was back home at Barberton. And she says, oh, young man, she said, what, uh, what are you doing? Are you catching butterflies with that thing? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to explain to her that the game of lacrosse a little bit, but in the spring of '66 we had our we had our first season, and we played uh, uh, Ohio State's JV team twice, I think, and we played the Columbus Lacrosse Club, we played Kenyon College, and uh, I'm trying to think of who else, uh, but but at any rate uh, we played six games, lost them all. And uh, but had a great time, and they elected me captain, which to this day I do not understand because I I couldn't catch, couldn't pass, but I they nicknamed me Steamboat because I kept the front of the the crease clear. Okay. I was a football player and I knew how to use my body. You were a bit of a tough guy. I, well, maybe tough guy is the wrong word, but I uh, you like contact. Well, I did like contact. I had. Uh, well, at the 25th... As a, as a nose guard, that at, would be at, true at 5'9". Yeah, at the 25th high school reunion, one of the guys I played ball with who who got a scholarship to Iowa State, he was our tackle, Tom. Tom, uh, we were having a beer together. He says, you know, Don, he says, you were, one of, you, you were one of the meanest son of a bitches I ever knew on the football field. I was a nice guy off the... I was one of those guys, nice right. guy off the field, but I put the pads on and it was, it was uh, business. And uh, mono a mono kind of thing, but uh, and I was a smaller guy probably, so that probably right. you know added to it. So so I graduate from college, and uh, I take a job. Uh, I took a job at Athens in, in teaching uh, actually in Troy, Athens. No, no, no. This oh, is Athens High Athens, School, Athens, Ohio. Oh, okay, yeah, I was still down in. One Athens. quick question: the original guy that got you involved when you came from Canada yeah. was he a box guy first? Or was oh, he, a he played. Guy? Oh, yeah, he played box. So that he had some. So this was his first probably endeavor oh. in the field, then, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, but and it, like most sports. like most Canadians, right. you know, they all played box. Right. But uh, but at any rate, uh, I I graduated. I started teaching down there, and I was coaching track and coaching football at uh, in Athens. So that went on for a year and a half. Actually, I went to grad school. Uh, right away to Penn State, uh, and then I dropped out after a quarter. I had a graduate assistantship out there in physical education. They had a brand new football coach. They were all excited about Joe Paterno. It was his first year. I went to all. You're dating the, yourself. Oh yes, I went to all the home games. I was in. I was in the card section. Yeah, you know, which was an experience. They used to have card sections. And the guy who just, just you know, he's coached for 50 years, so we're, we're dating yeah. ourselves a bit. Okay. So, you know, the, uh, the Army tried to get me at that time, like they did just about everybody. And uh, because of my ACL, uh, my knee was all swollen from playing uh, touch football in the flag football league, and uh, I flunked my physical. Oh, my. Uh, which was really, there's serendipity again, right? right. Uh, if I hadn't gone out for football at Ohio U, I would have been a second lieutenant in the Army, in 90, 90 day wonder, and I would have been in Vietnam. And again, I might not be sitting here talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those guys didn't come home. I, so I know that. So uh, anyway, uh, I, I made up my mind. I think it might have been at one of the track practices, which used to pour the hell out of me. I made up my mind that I was going to start a lacrosse team because of what I feel like I missed. And uh, wherever I landed, I was going to do that. Well, Athens wasn't the place. Uh, 
because I knew I wasn't going to stay there. So when I took the job at Lance Cruz up here, uh, that was uh, that was the year after the riots, 1968. How did you get to here? What was it? Would you just it was an open job? You were looking for for work? My I had, I had, one of the reasons I dropped out of Penn State was I missed my my uh, my woman who I married. And I went back and married her, and uh, she came home one day. Uh, I was teaching at the time down there, and she came home with a, a pay scale from Lance Cruz Public Schools, Michigan, because they used to go down and recruit. The, uh, Harry Wheeler was the assistant superintendent, and he used to go, they used to take a trip, and they used to go into Ohio. They went to Bowling Green. A lot of the guys I taught with here were at Bowling Green. Uh, Bob Lefkowitz was a former football coach I coached with. He was from Bowling Green. Uh, the superintendent here, John Armstrong, graduated from Bowling Green, played lacrosse there, helped me out in the early goings of lacrosse when okay. I started the club here. And, uh, and then they went down to Ohio U, they went to Marshall. They ended up at Bob Jones University, which is a Baptist college in, South, I think, South Carolina. It is. And uh, there were some guys from there, a uh, real good art teacher was from there. And uh, it, they, they really, Lance Cruz, I feel so fortunate that I came here because we had, I'm not bragging about myself, but I'm just bragging about the school that we had, the staff that we had. It, it was really a, a great place to teach, great place to teach, great place to be. Back, back in, uh, you know, I taught from 68 to 98. But anyway, I came up here the year after the riots. I didn't know any better. I was a young guy. I, I didn't give a, give a crap, you know, about riots. And uh, part of the incentive for coming here was the, uh, and it's, I, I always find this kind of interesting, is the fact that the, uh, the president of the school board was a, a gentleman named Glenn Peters. And there's a school out on Heidenrich by Dakota High School named after Glenn Peters, this gentleman. He was the head of all Chrysler security, all the plants. And if you came and taught here at Lance Cruz, you had a summer job. Wow. Which you needed. Right. Because you were making much. When, when I saw when I saw the pay scale, it was like a huge difference. Uh, I was getting five thousand dollars at Athens City Schools, and when my wife brought that pay scale home, it was 6700 starting. <laughs> I'm going, holy crap, they're paying that kind of money. And you look at that, people will laugh, but do the math and money. figure out what the percentage increase was. Right. It was quite a bit. Plus, I had a summer job right. uh, down at uh, Van Dyke and Lynch Road at Detroit Forge. I'm I'm a quality control inspector, and I'm born in September, so I'm, I'm a Virgo, a perfectionist. And they give me this job, and I'm walking around checking the connecting rods that, that all of these black guys that they hired to get them off the street after right. the year after riot. You know, I'm, I'm going around, and they're punching these out, and I'm stopping the procedure because they're not quite right. And then the job setter had to come in and reset the die. And these guys did not like me because they were working piecework. Do you know what piecework yes, is? Yes, I do. Okay, you, I, I go to work. I got 8,000 pieces I right. got to punch out. Right. When I punch out 8,000 pieces, I could sit on my ass the rest of my shift. Right. Well, here's this damn white guy coming around with a camera <laughs> shutting me down, not allowing me to do this. So I, it was a tough job. And uh, So you, are you calling yourself a perfectionist by yes. nature? Yeah. Okay. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. The I, other drive, I, I drive my wife crazy. The other thing I want to mention yeah. is that you're talking about $6,700 at the time when you can buy a house for 25000 to give them some scale of understanding. My first house I bought in Roseville was seventeen thousand okay, three hundred dollars. So I'll, I'll never forget that right. little little cottage. Right. You can't buy a, a used car for seventeen thousand today. So <laughs> just to give some some pers not perspective a good, from not the dollars. A good one, no. <laughs> so you're at Lance Cruz. I guess my first question to you would be: Did the Athens team continue to play that you started? 
Ohio University. I didn't start it. Tiff Cook did. Okay, but you said I, you went to a high school. I was just club around. Uh, no, not down there. Oh, up here. Just here. Okay. Yeah, when just here. And and Ohio U. I'm so proud of this. They have had a club lacrosse team there ever since then. That's a long time. Ever since '66. One with every interview we've done so far, I wanted to ask one specific question of every person because of their backgrounds. And here's my question for you: You're now coming into Las Cruz. You love the school district. You've mentioned those things. There are no other teams playing lacrosse. What in the world does goes through your head to start a program when there's nobody I, to play? I I, I did that, I didn't even consider that. Okay. I, is that a reasonable question? I, I, yes. <laughs> Very reasonable. In, in my, in my, well, can't play Indians. Yeah, I, I, in in my, uh, what was it, tenth, ninth grade science classes that I had, I I brought in a, a magazine. One of my former players has that magazine. It was uh, it was either Life or Look, and they had a big pictorial about the cross. Right. And there was some neat stuff in there. It showed kids playing in mud up to their ankles, showed them playing in a blizzard. And of course, young boys, you know, they're like, hey, you know, and I'm trying to talk them into trying this sport out, right. uh, which is actually a game, uh, not a sport. Right. I, I, I'll, I'll address that later. Okay. You can ask me the question. But, but at any rate, they got excited about it, about 15 of them. In the spring of 69, I took them out. Showed them how to play, and then, uh, and then it occurred to me, who are we going to play? So, so I did some research, and I found out there were two high school teams in Michigan at the time. Okay. One was at Cranbrook Kingswood, and one was at uh, University School in Gross Point. Liggett, to, which became Liggett. Right. Two women's teams. Couldn't play them. Right. Different sport, so I made yes entirely. So I so I I knew Michigan had a club. So I called. Uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name now. That's terrible. Uh, Italian fellow was the Giovanni. Yeah. Uh, Bob Giovanni. Yeah, Giovanni. Okay. That okay. was it. Yeah. Okay, Giovanni. Okay, you're familiar with him. Yep. And I called him up and I I asked him. I said, you know, I'm starting this high school lacrosse team. I said, we got no way to play. And he says, well, hey, well, we'll take care of you. We'll provide the referee. He was great. He was great. And so we played uh, the University of Michigan club team, not their best guys. They're, right. They're second stringers. Years later, Clark Bell, who's been very big in the lacrosse officials. Now living in South Carolina. Clark, Clark Bell came up and told me, he says, I played against you. He was on the U of M oh my. club team, and and we played, and and then I got this phone call from Mark Daniel. Don't know the name. Who you really need to include in this? And Mark Daniel, who? Mark Daniel is a guy who started the Wayne State University okay. lacrosse club, and he he called me because we were getting all kinds of press in the Detroit News. Because that's a brand new sport. Well, not just that. The son of the sports editor, Pete Waldmeyer, Pete Waldmeyer Jr., was one of my defensemen. And we should point out the Pete Waldmeyer Stadium is your, your current facility. So named, named yeah, it. After and he's a longtime Detroit Free Press. He was the Detroit News. News. Okay. Yeah. Longtime Detroit News columnist. Right. I and say that because I used to work for the Free Press. Anyway, there you go. A long time ago. So anyway, uh, I knew actually knew Pete. So, so that's that's how we got all this, uh, we got all this, you know, news uh, coverage and stuff was because of him. He had somebody in hand. And uh, yeah, and and uh, anyway, Mark saw this in the paper and he called me, said, "Hey, I want to play. I'm starting a team at Wayne State." So, that first year, the first season was 1970. We played Wayne State twice, and that was an experience. Because what Mark had was, you know, this 1970, long hair. Uh, kind of like you are now. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, 
This is what happens when you get you look old great. and I'm, you don't care anymore. I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, uh, what what happened was, you know, they, they came out on the field, and of course they were in the parking lot, you know, token right uh, before the games, and uh, you could smell it on them, and, and that was an experience for all of us. And uh, at any rate, uh, there were five games. The fifth one was Lake Ridge Academy outside of Valeria, Ohio, and their athletic fields abut the Ohio Turnpike. Now, I'm going home, you know, for Christmas, holidays, you know, all the time, and uh, on the Turnpike, and all of a sudden I look over, there's lacrosse nets out there. Lake Ridge Academy, just a tiny little uh, school, private academy. And another, another team to play. And so we played them. So we ended up three and two. Okay. We beat Lake Ridge. We beat, we beat the graduate student hippies from, from Wayne State. We beat them twice. And U of M cleaned our clocks twice. So uh, that was the first season. Okay. Then the next year I get a call from Gene Riley at Country Day. Okay. And Gene calls up and says, hey, you, I hear you got a lacrosse. I want to start a lacrosse team here at Country Day. Do you want to play? I said, hell yeah, I do. So that's when, that's when the competition between Michigan high schools started. It was 71. 1971. We, uh, I didn't want everybody to get too old, and I, I wanted to be around for it. So in 2010, uh, I put together along with uh, John. What's his last name? It was the coach at Country Day. Uh, and anyway, I got together with him, and uh, and we planned a game. We went and played Country Day in years, and uh, we, we had a really nice time out here. We had uh, we had a great time. I've got all kinds of the original two pictures. I can yeah, the original two is the 40th anniversary. I could not get the press or anybody interested in it, so it was just something that happened. You know, amongst ourselves, but yeah. we had a great time. Had T-shirts made up. Uh, I got eleven of my original players. Wow! Came back to it. Unfortunately, uh, Country Day was not able to get anybody from the original teams to come back for this game. Uh, and John J Kenny, John Kenny, okay, was the coach. Right. And John was very apologetic, and he said, "You know," he said. We don't do well out there with reunions. He said we had a championship uh, football team that his son, one of his sons, played on, and he said we had a 10-year anniversary of the state championship uh, team. And he said nobody showed up except my boy. Wow. I said, oh, I said, okay. So I, I don't know what happens to their alumni if they get spread out. Yeah. I mean, they go to they go to out east, to, you know, Ivy League schools and stuff. So I, they just couldn't, they couldn't get anybody, which was kind of a, kind of bad because we, we really did a neat thing. We had the uh, thirty years the, later, no, we had forty years, later. forty years. We had we had uh, the two teams. You know how you face each right. other and you shake hands. Well, I had my eleven guys standing at their position next to the high school player, right. and and they were supposed to have their alumni. Uh, you know, also, right. and they would shake hands right. 40 years later, like they did. But at that part, didn't work out. But everything else worked out really great. To reminisce slightly, if you were now a 30-year-old teacher and you went to your school district and your superintendent and/or your athletic director and said, "Listen, I want to start this club sport, but I want to play college competition." <laughs> That's pretty extraordinary when you think starting for the first year that you actually played, you know, seven, three, three quarters of a percentage of the kids you played were, were college teams, club teams. I get that, but Greg, that was well, kind of, was, that was, was, I feel so fortunate that I, I taught and coached when I did because, uh, first of all, you know, I landed in a place that was willing to let me do my thing right. and they didn't interfere with me. And of course, I tried to make the program as much a varsity program as I could, which I did. But we used to, in the early goings, I, I played the first year. John Armstrong, the, the future uh, superintendent, he played attack. I played defense. 
that first season. And you're a teacher. Yeah, that first season. <laughs> that's extraordinary. I mean, well, we didn't play against Lake Ridge Academy. No, but I'm we saying that's extraordinary. Against, if you think about it, that's extraordinary. Yeah, it was. But but it was like, uh, you know, we, we had to do that. But after that first season, right. we get into the second season in 71, and my, my kids start coming up to me. Uh, 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 Ronnie Barrows and uh, Bob Hanson. Bob was our, our goalie, and uh, he, he was, they were two of the team leaders. They came up and they said, Coach, he said, you know, the guys aren't comfortable with you and John playing in the games anymore. You're, you're taking up playing time. From other people. <laughs> so, so I I looked at him. I said, well, "I understand that." So we, you know, we we stopped playing. But, but we used to. You couldn't do that today. What I, what we did, you could not do because, right. because too many uh, rules. Because Wayne State had that club, and sometimes he was short-handed, and and I'd take five or six. I'd play, and I'd take five or six of our high school kids. Would throw the equipment into the trunks of cars, and we'd go to Ohio Northern. Uh, we'd go to Oberlin College in Ohio. Right. We, we, which was typical of the and, way it was in those days. And so we let's, would let's play. Put that and we would play on the Wayne State. Group. But let's put that in perspective. That was normal in those days. That's just the way it was. You know where we played? No. We played in an empty Spartan Stadium. We okay. played Michigan State's lacrosse team. The Wayne State group, wow. and and, uh, and it's weird playing in an empty stadium. I'm sure it is. Yeah, I just, at a time when Michigan State had turf and didn't have grass. Yeah, but so anyway. does it surprise you? The first team is a public school team, then the second team in obviously is private, and for the most part, it was a, it was at least if you think about it from the East Coast, it was an elitist elite type sport to a prep school type sport. Yes. So yes. the next few teams that came on board over the next three or four years were all private schools. Yes, it was. Um, it was after Country Day. It was Cranbrook. Then it was uh, a couple guys from uh, Detroit. Uh, from Country Country Day started a team at uh, Catholic Central. Was next, and then of course brother brother Rice jumped on board. What was the second? What What do you remember the second public school team being in? My Screws North. Okay. Roger Roger Bunton was my assistant the first couple of years, and uh, actually first, uh, well, it would have been 70, well, he joined us in 71, 71, 72, 73, 74, Roger was assisting me, and then in 75, they built the new school uh, out there uh, by 21 miles. So it was, it was a natural, natural uh, Land Screws North, and uh, the thought was never, we had a strong team here. Uh, but when it happened, the, the thought was never to keep it combined. It was always, you're going to North, you're going to start your own team at North, and, and we're going to have as many kids playing this game as possible. Okay. And that's why, I won't mention any names, but the, the teams that remain united, I don't believe in that at all. Um, Stay on your own. We could have. We could have done that here at Lance Cruz, but Roger and I were both in agreement that we want as many kids to enjoy this game as possible, and that was that was the major thing. So that was seventy. That would have been seventy-five. I had all the. They kept the senior class here, so I had all the uh, seniors. We had a real good team in seventy-five, but Upper Arlington, Ohio, had gotten really good, and they beat us out for the Midwest uh, Championship. So you were in the Midwest? Oh yes, we oh. were part of that. When did you drop out of the Midwest? <coughs> after after the uh, 79 season. Okay. Uh, I had, uh, I was getting prepared to get remarried. I was tired of traveling. I mean, uh, you know, we used to travel to Chicago 
of course, that wasn't part of the Midwest, but we played New Trier in uh, Winnetka, Illinois. We played Swickley Academy out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. you know, outside of Pittsburgh. And we went to Columbus and played. Uh, the first team in Columbus was Worthington and then Upper Arlington. Picked Kilbourne, up. all those teams in that area picked it well, up. Well, Kilbourne was a new school that developed years down right. the road. But uh, at any rate, um, uh, I just got tired of traveling. And uh, <laughs> I'll never forget, we went to Western Reserve Academy in Hudson, Ohio. That's another team that was in the original uh, Midwest, was Western Reserve. And uh, I had gotten from Eastside Sports, which used to be in a house on Van Dyke, right next to I-94. I don't know if you... I do know. you remember that? I do. Eastside Sports. Anyway, uh, I had ordered new... new game jerseys right and and I thought everything was cool and I, we picked up the jerseys on the way to Western Reserve on the way to Ohio so uh, we we, uh, we get down here and I open up the boxes they misspelled lacrosse they spelled it lacrosse instead so, of a double s they had a double o so we're out there with tape trying to figure you know it was a mess. So apparel problems are a long-term issue. That was, <laughs> I, you know, uh, it, it, it was so much fun. I, I was doing my hobby. I was. I didn't pay for it. Hey, well, not much. It was a club. Okay. It was like two percent. Right, but two percent of the pay. It covered. It do covered it. lunch and a gas. It wasn't money. Right. But uh, but at any rate. Uh, I just had a heck of a lot of fun, and and I and I feel sometimes that I've I've gotten personally t more recognition for what I did than what I deserve. There's other. Why, why do you say that? Because it, it would have happened anyway. Uh, Country Day was one year behind us, and and it was like, uh, yeah, I I did it. Supposedly first, I had the first team. I have to say, I have to say, I have to but, disagree. And the reason it would have happened. Go ahead. It would have happened anyway. I, you know, I, with I have, or without me. I have to disagree with this reason. You know, somebody will start something and be the first person to ever do it, and eventually people become better at it. But the guy that did it first deserves as much credit as the guy who became great at it. Not that you didn't become a great coach. My point to it is, it still takes the first guy to take the first step. And all of us wouldn't be sitting here without your first step. And that's pretty incredible if you think about it. I, I believe that to be true. And I think to diminish Possibly. what you what you, 139 kids playing high school across are 139 teams in Michigan. Is that many now? And probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 kids. Yeah. I mean. That's great. Now that's that's huge. That is that is, that is great. That's and I, and I don't mean to diminish your remarks. That's not my point. But I think you should take a a, a moment in the sun and, and realize just what you've meant to this the sporting community. That's a, the legacy is is beyond reproach. It's unbelievable. I, I just know there's there's individuals that have over the long term done uh, more than I've done. Uh, Doesn't Mike, matter. Mike Jolly from Doesn't matter. Ron Heaver. Doesn't matter. You know, there's there's a number of. Them. They've all done it, and it wouldn't have ever gotten this big without help. No. But it had to get started someplace, and that's something that we all thank you for. And I think that's something that just I don't think anybody in the sport that, that's been around in a while doesn't understand that. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I uh, my question: When did he? You had now as this thing was growing. When did the MSLA come in? When was uh, that? MSLA was... Which uh, was the Michigan Scholastic Lacrosse Association. No, the it started out as Midwest. Okay. We had the, we had the first Midwest tournament right away. Gene Riley was on top of that right away. He, I think he did that in either, I think, 71. Okay. His first year. And that's the same Midwest it was for a long time, which is the like Ohio schools and well, Michigan schools. And here's who it was. it was. It was Lance Cruz. We had a tournament out at Country Day. It was Lance Cruz. It was Country Day. It was Shady Side Academy from okay. Pittsburgh. Swickley. And it was no. Western Reserve. Okay. From Hudson, Ohio. That was that was, that was the, the original one. That was the tournament. Wow. That was the first Midwest tournament. How much has that changed? That's amazing. So when did when okay so you had Midwest but at some point I'm assuming you had to figure out the Michigan contingent of that group. 
Yeah, I'm trying to remember uh, that later when, that, when that started. Um, I think about the same time that, that I decided to drop out of the Midwest. 79, 80, uh, somewhere in there. 79, 80. Uh, it, you know, I decided there was enough teams that I could play here. I didn't have to travel. Right. And, uh, and, and then the other teams felt the same way. So, Gene, and Gene Riley was the catalyst for all that and uh, needs to get credit for that. And, uh, and he uh, formed the Midwest Cross Association and, uh, or the MSLA. We met out there at Country Day and we formed that. It was and, originally uh, six teams, is that right? Well, six or eight. It would have been. It would have been the two Lance Cruises. It would have been Country Day, Cranbrook, uh, Catholic Central, uh, Brother Rice, uh, and I think De La Salle. I think Mike Jolly had the De La Salle thing going. So seven or eight. By then, okay. yeah. And for a long time, it just seemed like nothing was happening. It was really stagnant. And and like I, when I, I I've been inducted into some halls of fame because of this. And in fact, the one that means the most to me is my hometown. Uh, they got wind of it, and they put me in the uh, Hall of Fame there. And, and, uh, in Ohio? Yeah, in Ohio, in Barberton. And I, and I, uh, I, okay. I, have, I have, when I, when I got up in some of these speeches for Halls of Fame, it was like, and in fact, it was the, the first, the first uh, la, lacrosse, Coach of the Year in Michigan was me. They were kind enough to do that, and and I sat there. And you want to include this because this is pretty cool. I sat there listening to all these guys that got up and talked before me, tennis coaches, uh, basketball, whatever, and uh, and they all had these marvelous records, one loss records, and they had won so many championships. And, I got up and I said, well, I said, I, I'm not sure I belong here. I said, you know, my, my record as a head lacrosse coach is 89 wins and 119 losses. <laughs> and I said, I could use it as an excuse that, that we had to play, besides our own sister school, we had to play private schools. Right. You know, a lot more resources. A lot more resources and so forth and, uh, and traditions, athletic traditions and stuff. So, uh, but I won't. <laughs> I said, I said but, but, I, but I did at one point. I remember, I remember one time particularly we really outplayed Country Day out here on our field. We really outplayed them in all facets of the game. But we didn't have the skill players to get it done. We lost by two goals. Mm. So we went to Reddy, Freddy's uh, rec ball down the road here for our post-game, uh, you know, drink. And uh, and I, I, I've always smoked cigars. So I lit up a cigar and I said, this this is a Vic Feet cigar. I said, <laughs> I, said <laughs> I said, we really had a victory in, in our defeat here because we we really, I think Bob Dowd might have been the, the coach at that time, Good but but uh, I really felt like, damn, you know, we we really won that game, but we lost it score wise. How long were you head coach of the lacrosse of the Moss Cruise team? From until, until seventy one to well from well, seventy seventy. Well, it, it's a checkered history because from seventy to uh, seventy to eighty two. And then I, I had gotten married, we had a child, and I, I was kind of burned out. I needed to get away from it. So I got away from it for three years. Uh, Graham Adams had the team here the first year, and then Joe Politowitz had the team. I mean, played for me. Uh, I had the team for two years, and then I came back into it. It would have been 86. I came back in in 86. And that's an interesting story because we had uh, – Prior to that, we had a, a parents' organization that, that, through Vegas Nights, raised money, bought equipment, paid for the referees. We, we had a really good group of people. And, uh, and then once I got out of it and then I came back in 86, that group had 
dispersed, it didn't exist anymore. Uh, the athletic director here asked me to let it die. And uh, I told him, I said, it's my baby. I said, I you started it. You know, this, this is my baby. I can't do that. I have to keep going. So, so uh, I had a truck. I had just bought a truck, pickup truck. And uh, I went into the newspapers and found out where they were having uh, uh, garage sales. And I called the person up and said, hey, can I come by on Sunday? Whatever you don't sell, can I have it? And there was a guy out here on Hall Road by where Morley's, behind where Morley's Candy is now, there, there was a guy that ran an auction back there, ran an auction house. So I'd go out on Sundays and I'd pick up all this stuff, take it to him, my consignment, he'd sell it, and I'd get the money, and that's how I paid the referees in 86. Jeez. Now in 87, the, the superintendent here had finally had it with lacrosse and said, we're gonna make you a varsity sport. So in 87, we became a varsity sport. So how long, after that, how long did you stay on for that? Till... I guess the question is, when did... 90. When, when did Don come in? 90. And, and, you know, Don Rhoda, who's still the head coach... So Don's first Don, year was 90, 91? 91. 91. 91, the season of 91. And you've been on the and, sidelines and, since then, too. And so. here's, here's the thing. Don wanted to be a head coach. He had graduated from here in 84 had coached with me right after graduation. He's a real good defensive coach. Coached on the football staff with us too, right out of high school. It was kind of unusual, you know, varsity staff. Didn't know that. So, yeah, right out. Yeah. So, uh, so Don uh, was bugging me, and I was tired of being head coach because I don't know if it was on purpose or if it just what goes with the head coaching job. Uh, I was inside the building more than I was out on the practice field. I was missing uh, the practices right. because I was dealing with this issue or that issue. Right. So finally I said, okay, I'm going to take, we, we always struggled getting our younger kids up to, up to par. So I said, I'll take the JV and you take the varsity. I'll be the JV coach. And so, so in 91 we did that. He immediately goes out and wins a tier two state championship. <laughs> his first, his first year as head coach, which I, which I thought was kind of cool. It was very uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so anyway, uh, I did JV for two years, and then I came, came up uh, in '94 as his defensive assistant, and I've been there ever since, since 94. That's a long time. We've played you off and on for 20 years, and there's never been a game that I haven't been on, that you haven't been on the sidelines that we've played, that I can remember. Yeah, I've... Whether it's St. Mary's for me or, or Oxford, we've always I've said... Been there. You've always been there. I missed my, uh, I missed my first uh, game uh, two years ago. In 2017, I had to have sinus surgery, and I, and I missed... Uh, a game with Stevenson out here. And that was my first and only one that I could think of. I won't ask you what's changed since the beginning because everything's changed since the beginning. But what, maybe speak a little bit to over the last 10 years what you've noticed in differences in lacrosse. Well, one of the one of the things in the early in the early days, uh, we got athletes. You know, we got athletes and non-athletes. I mean, what you got was you got kids that uh, they weren't any good at any other sport. They had tried some things unsuccessfully, and they and they uh, come out for lacrosse. And then you get some good athletes too. And it was hard in the early going because there were many years when I'd have uh, maybe four or five guys that were good skill-wise, passing and catching. And the rest of the guys were just learning the game. And a lot of them didn't come out until their junior year in high school, and in some cases senior year. And I remember talking to these kids, because they'd be good athletes that I coached in football. I said, why didn't you come out earlier? Oh, 
I didn't want to look bad in front of uh, the other guys. I've been practicing on my own. <laughs> you know what that's like. Yeah. Now you got all these bad habits. Right. Because you don't know any better. Yeah, because you, you didn't know any better. So, so that was a problem. That was a problem in the early going for us. Uh, it was, it was uh, terrible. We didn't have the feeder system that other that the private schools had developed, and that held us back. But, uh, but now, uh, I see a lot of the kids that we get. Uh, they're not playing other sports. They're they're just playing lacrosse. And I think that's a big mistake. I think I think kids, youngsters, should play as many competitive sports games as they possibly can, uh, because they're all interconnected right. in in ways. Well, and you've mentioned that you've been a track coach, you've been a football coach, you've been a lacrosse coach. When we all grew up, and I'm a little younger than you, but when we all grew up, you played multiple sports, and it turns out if you coached, you coached multiple sports, because usually in those days, when I was in high school, the basketball coach was the football coach, was often the baseball coach. Yeah. yeah. And you had to have multiple skills. And and you didn't have all the all these programs for kids uh, to play sports year-round. I mean, it's become a big moneymaker. No, it's, you know. And that's been a theme throughout this entire um, mm-hmm. Hall of Fame conversations with everybody, but sometimes I feel like I missed out. Well, it's, it's like maybe I should have, maybe I should have got in on the business end of it at a certain time. I, I don't agree with that because yeah. I, I've always made the joke. I, I have a nonprofit ski team that we've run for years. Mm-hmm. If I had a brain in my head, my my sailboat would be ten feet bigger. Yeah. It's not. So we, we, <laughs> yeah. we put kids in we we put kids in sports at least on the ski side. Certainly with lacrosse, the same thing. That yeah. might have not never had a chance to play. And we had a place up at Boyne Mountain that we used to put, and we had a two-bedroom, thousand-square-foot condo, and there were times when we've had as many as 24 kids laying on the floor sleeping. And nobody paid a penny because the house was paid for, right? Just what you do is a, it's just, it's that's the part of that nobody sees, and I, well, and, and I get that part. <laughs> that reminds me of the trips we used to take to Columbus and Chicago and uh, and Swickley. A lot of times, you know, like at Swickley or New Trier up in Chicago, they they would, the Canadian term is billet, right. our kids. And we did the same for them when they came down here. Right. But uh, but at any rate, uh, there were times when we stayed in hotels. And uh, like when we went down to Lake Ridge, we'd use Lake Ridge Academy as a midway point for, uh, let's say, Swickley or Shadyside to come over and play somebody from Columbus or Detroit who would play there at Lake Ridge because it was halfway in the middle. But uh, we used to, we used to go in and would sign in, you know, maybe three guys to a room, and the rest of the guys were out by the back door, and then and then you know you'd have like six, seven guys in one room, and it didn't cost much money. No, it cost everybody maybe no, you know five, ten bucks. And now it's it's it yeah. just doesn't it doesn't work that way. Last question: What's lacrosse meant to you? Obviously, forty-five years or fifty years of the sport that you've been involved. Yeah. What's it meant? I mean, you mentioned your baby, and it was, you didn't, it's, in your heart, what's it meant to you? Uh, I'm just... That's a hard question. I just very, feel very fortunate that I was introduced to it. I owe that to this Canadian fellow at TIFF, Cook, at Ohio University. If it hadn't been for him asking me that one question that one day in class... Maybe a great track coach. That maybe I don't know what, uh, but uh, I just feel very fortunate that that happened, and that I said yes and picked it up, and uh, because it's it's given me a lot of enjoyment, and uh, and seeing how the kids enjoy it, uh, of course, adds to that enjoyment, and uh, and, I, and I and I think about. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the uh, Native American Indian uh, culture and experience, and uh, and, and I, I've been feel privileged to have been a part of this. Um, I, I at the 1998 World Games that I participated, I was fortunate enough to participate in at age 54. Uh, almost 55 on uh, a uh, USA team, 
that got into the championship game at uh, where at Johns Hopkins okay. Field. Homewood. And, Homewood. Yeah, Homewood. Yeah. Yep. The the uh, the I don't know what they refer to that as, but it's the home of lacrosse right. for the Hall of Fame. Well, the stadium's Homewood Stadium. So. Homewood Stadium. Right. Yeah, stadium. Right and, next to used to be there used to be the old U.S. Lacrosse office was right next door. Oh yeah. 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 But anyway, uh, I met. Uh, probably the most impressive human being I've ever met in my life, and that would be Oren Lyons, who's an Iroquois uh, Onondaga uh, faith keeper of the Onondaga Nation, and he's a professor of uh, Native American Studies at Syracuse University. And uh, I met him, and, uh, and I was just really impressed, and I got to, uh, I have one that from that we it was serious business. Um, there were three USA teams. We played. Uh, we had a, a box team from British Columbia was representing the Canadians. There was a team from England. There was the Iroquois, and it was thirty. It was over thirty-five, uh, and you know I was like fifty-five. We had a, a second-string goalie who was sixty-two. We had this little character from Texas that was 65, an attackman on our team. And, uh, and it was just a wonderful experience, but uh, I was like one of seven long poles on my team. And I knew after the first two practices where, where I was in the hierarchy, I was number six, maybe seven, <laughs> but I think I was six. I was a little bit better than one guy. Okay. But these guys had all played college, and some of them were all Americans, and uh, and they've, you couldn't tell with their helmets on that these were older people. Right. I mean, they were fantastic. They still play uh, well. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I didn't get into too many games uh, in the early going, but then we played the I mean, they had to give us a couple minutes, okay, because we had to pay money right. to be part of it. So, so anyway, uh, we got against the Canadian team. They got up real high on them, and uh, the coach put me in, and uh, I played two and a half quarters. I had a great time, and uh, we, of course, won. But uh, there's your <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan MSU, fan. yeah. Anyway, oh, that's MSU. MSU, I'm not sorry. Michigan. I'm sorry. I won't call you Bowling Green. Don't call me a Wolverine. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm green and white from a long time back. No, sorry. You're, I get it. You're sorry, fine. Greg. But, but anyway, uh, uh, I was after the game. I was on the sideline, and the Iroquois were playing next, and they were short-handed, and. And uh, the the one and and I had met Oren Lyons and I was talking to him on the sideline. I got a picture of him and me. And, and uh, anyway, this one of their guys came up and asked me if I wanted to play for him. I was so damn tired. I said no. I should have played with those guys. You know, I, it's that's you have some regrets in life. And Absolutely. I, that's that's a regret. But I I wanted to go home and get by the pool and have a have a drink. And. Uh, and the funny part about it, my wife was flying in to Baltimore, Washington Airport the next following afternoon. So I went to bed that night. And in the middle of the night, I had to go to the bathroom. I got up out of bed. I fell flat on my face. My feet and ankles didn't work. Oh. From all that start and stopping. Right. You know, I had... And you're 55 at this point. I'm 55, <laughs> and I had to crawl to the bathroom. It was crazy, and uh, but but we had we had such a good time on that trip. I'm still paying for it. I think I put it on plastic. But we went down to Annapolis and we we're having dinner, me and my wife. And, and I said, you know, I said my my old football coach from uh, high school is the AD at the Naval Academy. I'm going to see if. There's a well back then they had public phones, right, right. phone books. Right, right. So there was a phone book at the restaurant. I said, "Well, look him up. There he is, Jack Lingle." Oh my God, from Marshall. Yes. <laughs> we are Marshall. Yes. That 
he was Jack a, Lango was that's right he was he from, was one of my football coaches in high school oh my god talk about a small world so, so I call him up and he I don't know if he was acting but he's oh yeah Don I remember you you know uh, yeah he says why don't you come down tomorrow he says come down to the Naval Academy and he says I'll, I'll show you I'll show you where to go so my wife and I make the trip back down there and that's a great place to visit the Naval Academy it is that's I've so been there plenty of times impressive but anyway, we went into Jack's office and you know had had a little reunion. And, and the funny part about it is, twice during the time that my wife and I were in there talking with Jack, his secretary came in and said, uh, "Mr. Lingo, the uh, the coaches are ready for you. Uh, your meetings starting. Uh, it's okay. Just tell them I'll be there in a few minutes." <laughs> You know, he didn't want. He, he was enjoying well, the conversation. And the, the rest of that story was he was a much better athletic director than he ever was as a coach because he wasn't very. He was. He did some unbelievable things as an athletic director at the Naval yeah. Academy and was all all kinds of call yeah. things. But yeah, pretty cool guy. But anyway, I so I, I have people, I have people in, in my history that right. that are they're kind of when I tell people about this, they kind of look at me like, oh, come on. No, <laughs> yes. no. Well, listen, I, we appreciate your time. You've meant a lot. You've meant a ton to all of us. Thanks. Serendipitously, I'm not going to be sitting here unless it was for you. So for all the folks that are going to watch yeah, this, uh, be here. I, you get my point. You'd I just think involved. it's important You'd for you. You'd be involved in lacrosse. No, I get that. Um, oh, and by the way, Oren Lyons corrected me one time. Uh, let's get to that. Sport versus game. Sport versus game. Okay, in, in 06, I, I went to London, Ontario for the World Games in Ontario. I'm so upset with them right now. They went to Israel. It was in London, and I was there for that. God's sakes. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing in yep. Israel this last time. They played at Western Ontario University. Yeah, you were there? I got a picture of it. Okay, great. So anyway, I was, I, I was on the sidelines for those games. So I went, whose sideline? On anybody that would play. I was, I, I was down there in a press pass. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm at the Aust Australia Iroquois game Okay. by myself. Right. I decided I really like Australia. And remember how hot it was that week? It was like 150 degrees that week. It was yeah. unbelievably hot. So anyway, I sat with the Australians uh, for the first half. They're, they're a hoot. I really enjoy those those people from down under. They're cool. Anyway, uh, at halftime, well, the day previous, I had bought an Iroquois hat from one of the ladies at the stand. So I had a real nice Iroquois hat on. And... Uh, I decided I'm going to walk over to the Iroquois side and see what's happening. Well, there was a security guard at the gate, but he saw that hat figured I was on the staff. I walked right in. I'm on the sideline, Iroquois sideline, for the second half. I'm standing on the bench with Oren Lyons. And, of course, I wanted to talk, and he, and he said, no, nope, not now. Right. Not now. He said, I'm watching the game. Right. I said, well, okay. I said, Maybe at, you know after the game, <laughs> you know. So uh, I made the mistake talking to him after the game. I referred to lacrosse as a sport. Warren said, "No, no." Lacrosse is not a sport. It's a game. And I said, well, what's the difference? He said, you look it up. You find out. And you did. He wouldn't answer me. So I, when I got home, I, I looked it up. You know. And? And? Sport is just a pastime. A game is a contest. A contest with a winner and a loser. And and uh, and that's the difference. The, the, the word contest makes the difference. So most, there it goes Michigan State again. Um, so most of these past times that we call sports are really games. And we should have Instead of Sports Hall of Fame, it should be Games Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. But it doesn't sound right. No. Right? 
So, right. so we have to say it incorrectly, just to make it sound right. But anyway, he, I found that to be very interesting. And I think with that story, we'll leave it there because that's, that's a great finish to this right. interview. Thanks again. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome.